this week. Christine's frame is refitted. A 225 Slant 6 is disassembled. And we continue the assembly of a beautiful 71 Cuda convertible. We're coming back on the air. Last week was a lot of fun having Tony out. I always enjoy giving him a hard time, giving him a little test. He does good. He, he, he brushes up. See, I don't. I'm all natural, right? If I know the T-man's coming out, I don't sit there and study up on everything. Uh, Tony, I know he's just sitting there sweating, reading the numbers and reciting them, going back over in the mirror, you know, Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. I don't know. It's a different movie. But having the 64 Fury gone over with Tony was great because I did learn a lot about it. And I knew it was rare, but I didn't know how rare. And a lot of the things that I thought might be factory and would be awful cool if they were factory, turned out to be indeed factory. On another note, last week was great because we got our 1970 CUDA tribute car. Drive train got installed in it. So really we're down to a final assembly on that car. And the folks have been very patient. I don't like to mislead people. There's still a lot of stress going on from the Christine standpoint. We just sent out the anodizing, the chrome, the polishing. So I'm hoping that we get it back later towards the end of this week or the first of next week. We'll be putting trim on at midnight the night before the show. So what's nice is Mosier Engineering is duplicating the original quote unquote 489 case. Now the 489 are the last three digits of the assembly number. It's a very popular case and it was the case that that car would have started life, well not that one, but our muscle cars do. It's, it's strong, you can't break them. So Mosier got the patent to build the 489 case and then they put an Eaton SureTrack in it, uh, this positive traction unit. So it's really a bulletproof setup and it's a lot easier to find than going out and hunting down an original eight and three quarter 489 case with a sure grip unit in it that probably winds or howls or doesn't uh, lock up like it's supposed to. It was the right answer for Christine for sure. Another nice thing about the reproduction 489 case is it has the provision for the pinion snubber. A two bolt pinion snubber, which is common for the eight and three quarter. And then uh, if you have a Dana, cause they also reproduce the Dana 354 and 410 rear ends. It actually has the three bolt provision for the really cool pinion snubber that would come on the Danas. Once you have the axle housing installed, the last thing is to put the axles in it. Uh, this also came with the rear end assembly. These are a sealed bearing where originally they weren't. You had to pack the bearings, slide the axles in, and then you had to set the end play from side to side. You no longer have to do that. These are sealed. You bolt them down, you're done. You also never have to worry about them again. And they're an alloy axle, so they're super strong. The other thing I like to do in, in the spirit of keeping everything original, of course, the nuts. They're, they are the original nuts for an eight and three quarter housing that come in our kits, our chassis kits that we also get from OER. So one of, the, one of the last things it did on the rear end was put the information tags on it. I just like that. I'd like to know what the gear ratio is. The factory did it, so why can't I? We have those tags in stock. We get them from OER. Why not put them on there? The positive traction oil, label or tag as well as the gear ratio. Okay, so you've heard me say a million times that the 1971 Cuda convertible is the most collectible muscle car, Mopar, muscle car on the planet. Well, it's true. You may not agree with it, you may not own one, but that doesn't change the facts. Historically, the 1971 Hemi Cuda convertible, for example, is the single most collectible car, selling for three and a half million dollars, one of only 11 made. Nine of them were automatics, two of them were four speeds but that just shows how rare, how desirable they are. If you wanna break those numbers down, the 1971 Cuda 340, convertible, they made 140 of them. Talk about a 383 standard engine and a 71 Cuda, they made 128 of those. Move up to the legendary 446 barrel. They only made 17 convertible 71 Cudas with a 446 barrel. And of course, as I mentioned, the 11 uh, Hemi cars. Now. Interestingly, our car is one of only eight ever built, but it's nowhere near worth three and a half million dollars. But it's one of eight because it's a 340 with a three-speed manual transmission. So it's rare and it's desirable. It's just not the most expensive 71 Cuda on the planet. Now this convertible is actually has a sales code of P, like Papa, 37. That means it's a power top, but they weren't all. 
Okay, so on our purple 1971 CUDA 343 speed, one of only eight made, <clears throat> while we are getting close to the finish line on that one and having it done, this is the part, while it's rewarding because there's a lot of fun trinkets to put on the car, it's also the part where anything can go wrong from the standpoint of it's the wrong part or you break putting it on or you scratch the paint, it's final assembly. So while we got the dash built out last week, it still has to be installed safely and carefully. So that's a two-man job to make sure it gets done right. So what we're working on today is a 225 Charger. This car is a 225 cubic inch slant six 68 Dodge Charger with an automatic on the floor. You don't take apart too many six cylinders nowadays. We sure don't. <laughs> yeah, go for it. You only made 904 of these. And only one of them was a standard transmission? That's true, that's true. We got an automatic on this one. Got our alternator off. I've done a couple of them over the years, but it's been a while. Most of the cars around here are performance cars. They're Hemis and six packs and 440s and 340s. So it'll be fun for those two guys to learn a little bit about the inner workings of the Slant 6. We got off. There we go. There Sweet. we go. What a strange little setup. See all this stuff coming out of here? And then we'll have to do a little bit of digging now as, as to exactly how that thing's supposed to be dressed out to be correct. So stay tuned for that. Yes. Corrosion, electrolysis, the aluminum is <laughs> dissolving. Oh, yeah. Look at all that. There we go. Oh, man. It's like chalk in there. Now, one of the things Doug and I have had a little sidebar about, he's saying that he believes it's a solid lifter mechanical adjust valve train. But I just don't see it in 68 on a slant six. Wish the decal was still in good shape. The decal? Yeah, I know. It's well, all torn What do you want to call it? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just messing with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's all torn up. I can almost guarantee him that that lifter is hydraulic, not solid. So we'll see how that goes. Still pretty clear though. Charger 225, huh? What would you have bought if you lived in 68? Hey, if, if this was my car, I would have loved it. I don't care that it only had 145 horsepower. It's an automatic. It's a 68 Charger, my favorite. I'm a cruiser, man. I'm not a drag. Just, as long racer. as it gets you point A to point B? That's right. Okay. We're anticipating getting the head off this engine so that we can find out whether it's hydraulic lifter or solid lifter. So one of my favorite things on the 58 Fury is the wide white walls. Now, I bought these from Coker for one reason. They're a steel belted radial that looks like a wide white wall bias ply tire. So it has the look of yesterday, but the performance of today. Mounting the tires on the rims is a piece of cake for the simple fact that I went with a 14 by five and a half inch steel wheel. So I happen to have a really nice set. We had them painted, we had them sandblasted and painted, and they're ready to take the tires on them. It's kind of fun for me to do mounting and balancing. When I go back to my early days, me and Royal, Royal used to work with me, we'd see who could mount and balance tires fastest, which by the way, I hold the record for, I think it's 13 and a half minutes, four tires mounted and balanced, key to key, meaning from the time you put the key in the lock to the time you lock the door back up again. So we have a question from our top fan this week, Mr. Rob Burgess. He is asking, what is the largest performing engine available in the Plymouth Barracuda, assuming he's talking the 1970. Barracuda, not CUDA model. 446 pack? Barracuda, not CUDA model. You know what, you're doing really good. I am? I got this new thing I do with him where I do this, and it, yeah, you just, that'll hold him. It's the 383 four barrel, 330 horsepower. The 383 two barrel, l code like Kimberly Cook's car had, had a 290 horsepower. And if you had a real CUDA model, it was five horsepower more. So if you have a question of your own, go on Facebook, become one of our fans. You could become our top fan. Ask whatever question it is, and if you are the top fan, we'll hit it next week. So Justin did a great job building out the dash. It looks really nice, it's fully functional. He tested it on the test bench, all the gauges work. So it's at a point where it can be installed in the car. And that's a two guy job. You don't wanna scratch anything. They're kind of heavy, they're clumsy. So he's gonna work with Doug and get the dashboard installed in the car, fasten it down, then he can continue to build out the rest of the interior. Okay. You on there? Yep. All right. There, I'm on there too. <clears throat> now, I don't know of any data out there as far as the factory installation of the dash, but when I look at it, it looks to me like it's designed to be done by one or two people. Okay, things looking clear? Yep. All right, let's rock it up. 
because you have bolts in the sides that go into the inner hinge pillars. You don't tighten them all the way down because that framework is going to come in and set down on it. You roll it up into place, you have five screws across the front of it. That all just seems very assembly line to me. So it wouldn't surprise me that the way we're doing it today is exactly the way they did it back in the day. It's a good clean system and it works. Okay, uh, yo. Put the bulkhead up on the firewall. Here you go, yo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Once all your connections are made, the dash is in place. It's a matter of putting the steering column in. Now, the steering column's already been restored. That takes a skilled person to be able to know what parts it is and make sure that it works the way it's supposed to, put it back together the way it's supposed to, that kind of stuff. But with that done, which is where we're at, it's pretty easy to put in. After that, you're done with the steering wheel, you're done with the dash. All right, there we have it. Our steering column is in, and this thing is ready to move on to the rest of the interior. 1971 in America, it was, a, it was a changing time. Everybody knows it was there, and if you read the history books, you had the wind down of the Vietnam War. You had gas prices that were just starting to skyrocket. So 1971, while it may have been the pinnacle, it was a very short pinnacle. It began to decline quickly. And the best example of that is the 1971 Cuda. One of the best looking cars in the world, but they made about half of them in 1971 that they did in 1970. It gives you an example of how the times were changing and people's tastes were changing. If you take a minute and look at the 1970 and 71 Cudas, let's just talk about the BS23, BS27 cars. There were changes, even though at a glance they looked the same. A 70 and a 71 Cuda use, if they have the same option hoods, they'd use the same hood, the same fenders, the same bumpers, the same doors, the same deck lid. For the most part, that's all true. Overall, they're identical. Subtle changes were made in some ways, such as the outside mirrors were a little different in 1971 than they were in 1970. They got bigger. Some of the changes that weren't as subtle is like the front end of the 71 Cuda. 71 Barracuda Cuda was the only year they had four headlights. They had two on each side, a high beam and a low beam. 1971 was the only year for the Barracuda to have four headlight system. The grill was unique from the 1970. The 1970 had a park lamp that rode up real high. It was very sleek. In 1971, they moved the park lamp down to the front balance, and they gave it a real cool, pointy look to it with reverse scallops in it. As you begin to walk around the car, you'll see that there are louvers in the fenders, these shark, simulated shark gills in the fenders in 71. They didn't have that in 1970. The rocker molding in 1970 was a really cool, a bit big, but it ran the entire length of the rocker. It was about two and a half inches tall, and it also looked like fish gills going down the side of a car. In 71, it was just a clean aluminum anodized molding. The taillights are different in 71, but similar to the 70. In 1970, you could buy a Cuda with a 375 horsepower, 444 barrel engine. They pulled the four barrel engine out of the lineup in 1971. You could not get a 71 Cuda E-Body, Challenger or Cuda, with a 444 barrel. It was only available with the E87 446 barrel or six pack if you had a Challenger. The 1971 Plymouth Cuda convertible, they built a total with all the different engines of 374 of those cars. 140 of them got the optional small block 340. 120 of those came with the standard 383 four barrel high performance would be the Super Commando. Only 17 71 Cuda convertibles left the factory with a 446 barrel and only 11 with the legendary 426 Hemi. Our car has a standard three speed manual transmission making it one of only eight 1971 Cuda convertibles with a 340 and a manual three speed transmission. I'm pretty sure it has adjustable rockers on it, so I feel that it has solid lifters. Here we go. Look at that. Look at that. It's a Holly. Nice little one barrel carburetor. Okay, so this is the choke stove with the bimetallic spring in it. That, that's what it's called, a choke stove? Uh huh. Kind of like an oven down here in the manifold. The bimetallic spring heats up, opens the choke on the carburetor. Let's see. Might be an original starter. Yeah. 
Look at that. Intake and exhaust. Dual manifolds. Oh, it's busted. Oh yeah. Look at that, it's busted. It's all cracked over here. All right, let's see, how can we get in here? Right here. Okay, we found our rockers. A whole bunch of them. So now we found adjustable rocker arms here. Three teens and other engines didn't have adjustable rockers. They were hydraulic. On this one here, you have to adjust the valve tolerance on the rocker shafts here. Little adjusting screw on, on the sides of the rocker on the push rod. What we're after here is to pull off the rocker shaft. We're gonna pull the head off and we're gonna find out if this has hydraulic or solid lifters. My vote is solid. Hydraulic lifters are pumped up with oil and they take up all of the adjustment from the push rod to the valve. And solid lifters, you have to adjust the rocker to take up the difference. Lift off the rocker shaft, adjustable rockers. Here's the adjusters right here, little adjusting screws. Here's the part that fits into the push rod. Go ahead and pull out all the push rods. One thing I like about the Slant 6 is the spark plugs go right in the side of the head through these little tubes, and they're pretty easy to change out. And a uh, little distributor down here on the side. Look at those cute little pistons. <laughs> Six cylinders. Now we can see where the lifters are. Oh, moment of truth. Okay, here we go. You got so, it? Yeah. Look at that. It's a solid lifter. No hydraulic. Guess that means you were right, huh? Sometimes I get lucky. Hey. Mopar Master over here. Well, that's what I was saying. That's what I was saying about the engine. You guys you need to start recording more of this stuff and play it back, because what I was saying was... High performance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. No, wait, what? No. So the next step on the CUDA is to put the carpet in it. Uh, we have bought our carpet from the same place for years. Uh, many years ago, we used to buy it and it would come rolled up in a box, which is fine. It was a good product, but rolled up in a box, especially if it had just been formed, means that you have to reform it. We get ours from ECS. So what happens is they come in in a huge flat box and it's just folded in half. So when we go to put those in, the steaming process is five minutes, 10 minutes, and you have everything fitting nice. There's no crumples in the floor, like anybody who's put the rolled up in a box carpet in has that. Well, we've learned how to get away from that. I know that I've been restoring these cars for many years and I know a lot about it. I still make mistakes, makes me human. But I think that sometimes people can be intimidated, right? I don't want them to be, but I think I go back to when I worked at Lincoln Mercury. I was kind of intimidated working under the boss. I was more cautious, kind of like nervous, right? I hope he's not doing it. I hope Justin's really taken time to just realize that I'm here to help him help us, like the movie, right? Help me help you. I want to be able to spend the time that I am with him and feel comfortable that he's absorbing it because I, I could do this whole thing with anybody. I choose which ones I want to do it with. I've learned in the past, I've took time and trained people only to find out that they had their own agenda and wanted to go do something else. Who knows what that is? But in this case, I've got a really good feeling that he'd like to be here for the rest of his life. And that's a good thing because we need some lifetimers here. It's going to help us speed up our productivity and not have any kind of QC issues maybe that we've had in the past. So like I've said before, on any of these cars, the hard stuff is the engine, the transmission, the body, the paint, getting it all kind of formed together there. The fun part is the final assembly. Yes, it has its potentials for damage, but putting chrome, trim, side markers, fish gills, moldings, pinastars, wheel opening moldings, bumpers, grills, belt moldings, tail lights, all that trim just brings that car to life. And it's definitely the funnest part. I have always felt that the assembly guy has the best job in the house. Most of the cars that we don't replace the exterior trim on, 
and we have to recondition it. We sublet it out to a guy in town here that does metal straightening. It usually needs to be straightened, usually has anodizing, has to be stripped and then re-anodized or stainless and takes a certain hand to do that. So this was the kind of thing Justin could do. I spent some time with him before on several other cars and showed him. It's a pretty humble little setup we have, but it works great on this stuff and it allows us to control the end result, the finished product, as well as the time to get it done. The frame still needs to be built out and prepped for our 58 Fury, the Christine car. And that's a matter of we're converting the front brakes to a disc brake set up on it. We have the engine and transmission mounting that we have to put into place, get all of the things ready so that when we set that engine and transmission on there, it's in place final permanently and we can build around it when the body shell comes back around. So the nice thing about Christine is it uses a leaf spring rear suspension, torsion bar front suspension, just like the cars we work on today. I was able to use a Mopar rear shackle, brand new ones that we stocked that we put on the muscle cars. I ordered a pair of replica, original, duplicate leaf springs. And then the original hangers, all we had to do was take them off, media blast them, paint them, and get ready to put it back on. So our bushings and our inserts and things like that, we were able to use the stuff off of today's car on that car. So there's some interchangeability there, which I think is kind of cool for that many years. Another, what, 10 years prior to the stuff we're working on, they were using the same stuff. So like anything, when I'm, when I'm out there working on these cars and you've got a lot of heavy stuff, I've said it a million times, have good equipment, trust that equipment and use it the way it's supposed to be used. You won't have your injuries, you won't have things getting broken. It just is a much better way to be. I couldn't always afford good equipment, but now that I can, I'm filling the shop with it because it makes a difference in the end. Now originally these cars did not have air adjustable shocks, but I wanted to put them on there. If you have an air adjustable shock or an air shock, we call them as kids. If you have one, you don't have to use it. The leaf springs are gonna be there. But if you do need more ride height, because maybe these springs aren't exact when they're supposed to be, or maybe the car's heavier or lighter, who knows? You can adjust the ride height of the car with the air shocks. In the front, I can go up there and do torsion bars. Turn them up if I need the car higher, turn them down if I need it lower, blah, blah, blah. But in the back, if you wanna have any adjustment at all and you don't wanna lose your ride, you wanna go with an air adjustable shock. Once that's done, we can mount up the really cool uh, wide white wall tires, one of my favorite things, on the five and a half inch factory steel Mopar rims, five on four and a half bolt pattern. After that, we'll have a rolling chassis. We'll be in a position where we're waiting for the body to come back, and that's a good place to be. So on Christine, we had the entire frame powder coated, mostly for well, two reasons. One is powder coating fills an awful lot, so you don't have to, as much body work to do to it to make it have a nice finish. Also, it's durable as hell. You can drive that thing down a gravel road every single day of your life and you'll never get that stuff off. You can't get it off. You can't even sandblast it off. You have to chem it, you have to physically grind it off of there. Because it's so durable, I let our powder coater go ahead and do the eight and three quarter housing that I had. And remember, that housing's out of a 1970 Dodge Charger. It's only a quarter of an inch on each side narrower than the original rear end that was in the car. But the eight and three quarter that we got out of the Charger allows us to use all the things we're used to using. The brakes, the drums, the actuators, the cables, all that stuff. Christine never actually existed as a car. They use both a Belvedere and a Savoy to portray the evil automobile. Our Christine is a 1958 Belvedere, which was iconic all on its own. To understand why, we had to jump back to the previous model year. 1957 was a big year for Chrysler because they jetsoned the styling that Plymouth was known for and caught the competition off guard. Suddenly it's 1960. That's what Chrysler's ads claimed because they completely changed the look of the car, dropping the body lines and replacing them with the signature look we recognize today, commonly known as the forward look. Despite selling exceptionally well, the 1957 Belvedere was rushed into production and after issues with rust and faulty parts, Chrysler's reputation of quality and reliability was tarnished. Despite this, Chrysler regained leadership in styling and brought a new suspension system, which would keep them on top in handling until the 1970s. What was it? It was the torsion bar suspension, 
a unique approach at the time that we muscle car girls and guys are all too familiar with. And 1957 was the debut of the all-important Torque Flight automatic transmission, which opened the door to customers who rejected both the manual transmission and the two-speed power flight. The Torque Flight would quickly earn a reputation for durability and efficiency, allowing automatic equipped drag racers to win against manual transmission cars. 1958 focused on quality, which dramatically improved along with some styling changes. They replaced the lower bumper pan with a lower grille and installing real dual headlamps, which created the necessary foundation for what would eventually become immortalized as Christine. George has been working on this 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. This is a convertible, which you can tell, but it's a 383 four-speed car. Very, very few four-speed convertible Roadrunners were built. This is one of those. Now, unfortunately, the downside to it is it was a really rusty car. So when we got it back from the dipper, it needed everything. We're in the process of replacing the rear frame rails, rear body panel, inner and outer wheel houses, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions, under seat pan, rear step wells. We have already replaced the main floor and the transmission cross member. Now, ironically, the front of the car is in really good shape. So there'll be just some small patchwork that needs to be done up there. All right. So the piece I'm talking about is right here. This is quarter inch plate steel. It's shaped and mimics the inside of the rocker itself. So it follows the bottom of the rocker up the side and across the top. So you see right here, it goes all the way out to here and then it spot welds down inside here. This being quarter inch plate and it runs all the way from the edge of the rocker here to the very front. You won't see that in a hard top car. Okay, if you go out to our hardtop, our 1970 Coronet, and take a look at that, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's because we have no roof to hold the car together, Chrysler thought, and rightfully so, it would be a good idea to reinforce the rockers. So that's what these are. I believe that this part is actually available in the parts book. I think you can go back to the original parts book and actually order one of those back in the day if you were to happen to get in a wreck. So we have the other side opened up, and this is ready to get the new inner rocker. That's how we were able to see all of this. We already did the inner rocker front section here, like I said, with the floor. So this piece will go in like this, set something like that. Across the bottom, it'll get spot welded along here. And it'll get plug welded down here. And that will help finish off the reinforcement and, and the strength of that rocker panel. So we're kind of, what we wanted to do because it was so rotten in the main structure is we wanted to do it piece by piece so we didn't lose the overall geometry of the car. Like we have in the past when you blow something completely apart, you can lose things, lose its geometrical shape and so you're fighting that all the time. So in this case, if you just leave it together, it moves it a lot faster through here. So there you go. Good there? Man! You wanna go through that way? Yeah. So our 1971 CUDA is drawing close to the finish line. One of the last big things that we have to put on is our convertible top mechanism. Now this is a power convertible top. That's not standard. You had to order P37 to get the power, otherwise it would have been a mechanical top like a couple of the cars that I have out back. So right now we're getting ready to put the convertible top mechanism in. We'll bleed it out. We'll adjust it as close as we can without material on there. Then Larry can come out, get the material put on it. We can do the final adjustments, fit them to the side glass and the quarter glass, and we'll be ready to put the rest of the few things that are left on and get it out for a drive. This is just a rough fit. Yeah. So if we just sure. held it up against it into place and then wherever this naturally wants to sit at that time, that's probably where we'll lock it down. Okay. And then Larry can play with it if he needs to. Yeah, sounds you good. You have a power box there. Here we go. I'm a believer. I'm a faithful man. See that side's a little softer, but it's going. So a little adjustment on that one. Now remember folks, this is our 1971 CUDA 340, three speed manual transmission. That's the standard transmission. Only eight people opted not to go up to a four-speed or to an automatic. So this is one of eight. It's an inviolate, white top, white interior. It's a very rare car. You won't see two of these at a local car show. So yeah, with that, we have, there's a hundred little adjustments between these bows and the actual vertical and horizontal bars right here. 
but we'll dial those in as Larry's getting the material ready. We can start, we can get the windows rolled up, put some rubber in there, put your Metro molded rubber in place, just even to mock it in there. Oh, yeah. And we'll dial it in. Nice work. Yep. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful car. It's good seeing that on Somebody's there. going to be extremely happy, I think. So with all the pieces that we've got done so far on our 71 Cuda, it's getting really close to being able to deliver to the customer. Uh, Larry will come out, he'll do the actual material that goes on the top, but the mechanism is in place, everything is aligned like it should be. So really with just a few hours after Larry's done, we'll be able to wrap this car up, call the guy up, have him come out and deliver the car to him. Hi, Gun Dougie. Hi, Mark. Don't let me stop you. Dude. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I haven't seen you in a while. Okay, so a couple days ago, we got our engine back for the 1971 Cuda. This is the one we dubbed the Phoenix Cuda, the one that uh, Wendell had. We talked about it a couple seasons ago. It got caught on fire, had a big explosion. So the biggest thing that had me apprehensive was the condition of the engine. When we sent it out to the machine shop, it didn't look very good. It looked pretty bad. After Doug tore it down, you could see that there was pits in the cylinders that were pretty deep. There was a lot of fire damage. So I was completely relieved when the engine comes back and the worst case scenario was it had to be bored out to 60 thousandths instead of maybe a standard bore or 30 thousandths over. So yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised at how nice this block is. But it looks like with some elbow grease and some hard work, a lot of the stuff that wasn't made of pot metal or aluminum, we're going to be able to reuse on this engine. Uh, Doug's got the short block pretty much built out except for the camshafts. But this is a really cool camshaft. We uh, always use comp cams. It has the original three bolts. They make a single bolt one. A lot of people put them in, it's probably less money. I don't know. But the three bolt is the way it left the assembly line. So the three bolt is the special camshaft we're putting in this engine. Let's talk to Bill Gibson, the guy with the uh, Christine that was out here a few years ago, the 58 Fury. Yeah. So it turns out that he shipped the car up to New York um, like a couple weeks ago because it's gonna make a cameo appearance in next season's Castle Rock. Yeah, there's a cameo scene where it's driving down the road, so they used his car to do it. I thought that was pretty cool. Wow, lucky guy, huh? You hear that, Petey? That's pretty cool. Show Petey over here. Petey's our in-house uh, horror genre lunatic filmmaker. Anyway, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. That's gonna be cool. Did you ever watch season one or not? No, I was busy. Yeah. I had no. to work that day. Yeah. Our other top fan this week on Facebook is Mike Stackhouse. He wants to know if we would ever be willing to restore a 1970 Chrysler 300H, as in Hearst. We actually have a 300H here from a gentleman down in Florida that we are in the process of getting ready to restore. The 300H is a really cool car. It's two door, it's a hard top, has a fiberglass hood and deck lid, uses a high performance 440 in it, but Chrysler called it the 440 TNT. So if you have a 440 TNT out of a 70 Chrysler 300H, give me a call, I'll be happy to buy it. So if you have a question of your own, go onto our Facebook page and post it there. If you're one of our top fans and we select it, we will answer it next week during Graveyard Cars. Doesn't get any better than that, nope, right? that was good. Can I show these guys something? Well, oh, yeah. Okay, so the reason I stopped Doug is I wanted to point out that this is a 426 Hemi. So from the factory, it had a three bolt cam. Three bolts held the sprocket onto the camshaft. There's only one other engine in Mopar's history that does the exact same thing, uses three bolts, and that's from the factory, a 446 back or six barrel if you had a Plymouth. You know, so that's just a unique thing I wanted to point out. That's all, is it, that it uses the three bolts. Now, we could have gone with just a single replacement bolt type cam, they make them, but Comp Cam makes the exact ones, replica lift duration. I mean, this is the factory camshaft. And you know me, I like my factory stuff. What are you putting, 30, 35? Yeah. It will work better when you turn it on. <laughs> yeah, guaranteed, guaranteed. It's on. Yeah, you Let's just turned it on. Try it again. It to 1,000, okay? Look at that, Mark. The I green like light came on. <laughs> like it. How are we doing here? In a second, I'll show you guys the statistics, and then I'm gonna go back to- Making coffee? Normal land. I try to talk to this and make some coffee. I doubt she will. Would you do me a favor? Yes, sir. Now, see this little yellow dot right here? Next to that other little mark right. Actually, it's right on it. That little yellow dot's right on the timing mark. That little dot is right on the timing mark. You'll notice how the cam gear is at six o'clock. 
and the crank gear is at 12 o'clock. That's the way they're supposed to be. And when that happens, the number one piston is at top dead center of the compression stroke. So with my little uh, education there on the camshaft and pistons, I'm able to let Cousin Dougie continue on. I think he's ready to start working on the bottom of the engine, getting it buttoned up. That's like the windage tray, the gaskets, the pan, the sump pickup. Get it all buttoned up, roll it back over, then he can start working on the cylinder heads, the valve train, which is an intricate thing. We'll show you that later. And at that time, once he's done, we can get it on an engine run stand and fire it up. And I think Wendell's going to be extremely happy when he hears that engine for the first time in 22 or 23 years. Now the thing about this conversion set is I was able to use the 1970 to 72 rotors, inner bearings, outer bearings, grease seal, calipers, caliper mounts, all that stuff was factory 1970 to 72 disc brake. So if you have a breakdown somewhere in another country, another state, another world, and you need a caliper or you need a rotor, or you need pads, just tell them you got a 70 Dodge Charger. You'll come up with everything you need. That's keeping it in the Mopar family. The only negative takeaway I had was with the disc brake conversion, you can't use the brake shields, the dust shields that you would normally use. So the stones can go up in there and hit the rotor if you're on a gravel road or something. But I think if I had more time, I could probably build something that would work. But for this particular thing, just to get to the show, I'm not worried about it. When we first got the car, Doug and I was trying to get the front brakes working on it. God, what a mess. It used dual wheel cylinders, dual adjusters. It was just a nightmare. We had it all adjusted perfectly, went out and hit the brakes. The steering wheel flipped to the left and we damn near died. The worst braking system in the world. So I wanted to convert it to a disc brake if it was possible and manageable. And it was because I was able to get hold of the guy that actually makes them. He's the one that came up with the conversion kit. Most of the 58 forward looking, 57 to 60, Plymouths out there end up having the disc brake conversion for that reason. Uh, I think it was AAJ up out of Portland, but he came down and showed us how the conversion works, how to put it together, which was really cool for him to take the time to come down and do that. But it just makes putting it together on the car so much easier when you have the guy who invented it showing you how to do it. I really felt like the disc brakes were important when you consider the fact they say a, a front brake on a vehicle does about 70% of the stopping. That's a lot to be putting on a pair of shoes, old shoes with adjusters that aren't automatic and they just flip around and lock up and try to kill some poor <laughs> driving down the road. One of the things I had plotted from the beginning of Christine was, of course, to keep everything in the Mopar family, keep it all to the stuff that we know. So if we're putting on 70 to 72 disc brakes, that's what Doug does every day. He does, he does one a week, one complete front K member a week. So he knows what they are, he knows what parts they are, and we have them in stock. So it just makes the build out of that front braking system a piece of cake. The windshield trim for this car was beautiful. I mean, other than needing to be 
ran across the machine. The, the polishing wheel that we use puts color in it. They call it coloring it. It gives it that bright, crisp look, but there weren't even scratches in it. After that, really, he just has the convertible top mechanism, the inner workings of that, the cables, the tie downs, the inside of the header. These are the clasps that hold the top down, the visors, the mirror, uh, some exterior trim and ornamentation. Once he's done with that, we'll really be getting close to a point where we can take it out and go for a drive. So doing the final adjustments on the roof intersect with everything to do with the windshield because that pillar is such an important thing to the windshield. They fasten together with, with clamps or uh, clasps. All of that is established a little bit at a time. Does the top need to go up in the back? Does it need to go forward? Whatever it is, those adjustments have to be made so that when you put your clasp in, you tighten it down that the windshield header and the roof itself, the actual roof, have the same reveal, the same gap, the same fit. All that stuff has to happen while you're putting the windshield and the trim in. It doesn't have to happen at the same moment, but you want to pre-fit and make sure everything fits the way it's supposed to. Moldings, uh, windshield uh, reveal molding clips, they need to be in place. So this last little bit is just time consuming. And you have to take your time and make sure it's where you want it before you finish that car. had a great week. Uh, now look at our Christine car. The framework is all done on it. The rear end is in. The suspension for the rear end, the engine and transmission, the disc brake conversion, everything is mocked up on that frame. Wheels and tires are on it. So it's going to be a lady in waiting for the body to come back, marry the two together so we can start assembling that car. Our 71 Cuda 343 speed car in violet, FC7, one of only eight made. People like it when I rattle off the numbers. That car is getting a lot closer. We got the dash installed in it. We got the rest of the uh, convertible top mechanical pieces installed in it. We got the carpet. We got the steering column. That car, a lot of trim and ornamentation got done on it. So it's really getting close to being done. That's a, that's a good feeling, especially knowing, again, that we're a little bit behind on that one as we are with so many cars. But the owner's really been patient and is super excited to get it back. So I'm also equally excited to finish it, which won't be long now. Doug and his helper over there were able to disassemble the 225 out of our 1968 Dodge Charger. This is a little slant six with the automatic transmission. That's all disassembled and ready to go to the machine shop and the transmission shop. I enjoyed working with Ezra today, taking this little slant six apart because it was new to both of us. And Meanwhile, Doug is needy in assembling the 426 Hemi for Wendell's 1971 Cuda, the Phoenix Rising 71 Cuda. So I'm looking forward to seeing that one all completely built and done because there's just nothing sexier, nothing prettier in the world of automotive than to see a well-assembled, correct 426 Hemi for one of these muscle cars. Just the coolest thing on the planet.